One, two, three, go. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on your time zone. It brings me pleasure today to be among these distinguished guest speakers. Each one of them has his own original contribution to the main domain of designing for extreme environments. Uh, the diversity and uh, the, the cultural background of each one of them will enrich our speaking speech today and our talk today. And uh, let me just make a quick introduction about the vision that really uh, gather us all together. So we think that technology in the last 25 years is equal to the technology that happened in the last 200 years. And the technology that occurred in the last 200 years is equal to the technology that occurred in the history of humanity. With this vision, I mean modern day technology is not what advanced civilization, it is what advanced civilizations 200 years ago considered to be magic. <clears throat> With this pace of technological advancements, I believe in the few coming years, the modern day science fiction will be the science reality driven by the design fictions we do today. We will be presenting to you today the vision of our guest speakers, distinguished guest speakers. Each one of them will be presenting his, uh, his uh, contribution from his part, his vision, his idea about what is known as extreme environments. Our designs, our visions, our solutions that will be offered today is, will not be only beneficial for the human uh, race outside Earth, but also on Earth in a case of an, any existential risk. Please, let me start with our first speaker, Vitoro. Hello, Vitoro. Pleasure to meet you today. And uh, please let the audience know a little bit about you. <clears throat> so Elif will be uh, giving a short statement just to let people know who you are. Yeah, okay. Our first presenter of today is Vittorio Netti. Uh, he is graduated from bachelor's degree in architecture and a Master of Architecture at <coughs> IUIB, and a Master of Science in Space Architecture at the University of Houston. Vittorio is graduate researcher at the SIGSA and teacher assistant at the UH and Polimi. He is also a PhD candidate in aerospace engineering at Poliba. Vittorio is a project manager at DOME and Vector Robotics with which he is involved in different analog missions. In the last year, he worked as a consultant at Search Plus for the Olympus project with the NASA and MPACT team. His re research is focused on the automation of planetary construction techniques. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, uh, for the introduction. Um, I, I have like a slide of introduction, but I think that you already did a a uh, great job presenting me, so we can uh, we can go further. So as uh, I said, my um, main field of work is about like uh, human robotic collaboration and interaction for uh, different purposes. Some of them they are connected to exploration, but also um, uh, but also like construction, for example, both like a planetary and the orbital. So I will present uh, today some of my projects that I'm working and I worked on during the last years. Um, some of them are uh, still like ongoing right now. So we start. Um, yes, this was like a, an introduction of myself and the uh, uh, entities that I work on uh, currently. Um, but we can go straight to the presentation. So like my vision about space is that if we want to reach a certain level of um, human presence in space, we need to enable a high level of safety and accessibility. So space, it's a, a space is hard, as like uh, JFK was saying, but at the same time, we need to make it easier and less complex um, if we want to really like live in space and live on the other planets in a stable way. Uh, to do that, uh, my answer to this, this question is like to improve 
uh, robotics and to improve like uh, robotic collaboration between humans uh, and machines in space. So how, how we do that, as I say, it's like through the advancement of space robotics. Um, here we see some examples, some at a con uh, were like old concept, new concept. Um, things that we tested, like the mm, things that we currently use, like the Carnadarm or, or uh, Robonaut. Um, this is like a, a paper, interesting paper by J.B. Garvin that I found in uh, some years ago. Like uh, J.B. Garvin was like the ex, uh, chief of the directorate of human space exploration at NASA at the time. And um, <clears throat> He basically, uh, together with the, mm, a group of engineers and GPL, he tried to evaluate uh, the reason like why we explore space in the way in which we do and why um, from a, a system engineering point of view, humans and robots are not like interchangeable. Like uh, human robots, they cover different uh, tasks and skills in different ways. This is like his findings. Um, so on a list of skill, we can see the, like how uh, actually robot, they do uh, worse than human in most of the cases. Um, humans are more versatile uh, and, and the current state of the technology. This is of course, it's a paper from 2005, so it can be a, a bit old from that point of view, but still nothing changed too much from, uh, from that moment in space robotics. So um, as I was saying, we mostly do everything good, like, but three things the robot do better. And these three things are very important. And this is the reason why even if we as humans, we, are, we can perform better than robots, uh, we still, mostly used robots for space exploration. So the, the three elements, that the three skills that we are looking at it right now are precision detection, but most of everything, uh, expandability. Expandability, it's like one of the main reasons why we use still robotics uh, for space exploration and the fact that we can accept to lose even like a billion dollar robot more than a human life. Um, so uh, looking at, at this like uh, uh, table, what I was thinking when I started this research is why not both? So like why not using uh, both set of skills uh, when we are talking about space exploration? Um, so the vision can be concretized in like uh, cooperation between human and robots in space. And uh, so I started researching how we can do actually that. So the concept here that I show for this pre first project, it's uh, applied to one of the most um, dangerous fields in space exploration, that is um, uh, robotic augmented EVAs. So EVA operations are one of are definitely like the most dangerous that we, uh, between the span of operation that we can perform in space, um, and so it's. I was thinking one of the first fields in which we can we should introduce space robotics in an intensive way. And this is what we already do with like Canada, for example. And here we see uh, in the picture like um, the NASA Robonaut that has been tested um, and the wish is many use should have been like exactly to perform EVA operations. But EVA um, Robonaut was intended to uh, to substitute like uh, a human uh, um, member in EVA, while my concept is like to have joint operation between robots and uh, astronauts in space. So it's that I started developing the MMVR that is state for multi-mission extra vehicle robot. That is like a concept for a flexible um, asset for EVA operation that can operate in both ways autonomously or in conjunction with uh, other humans uh, in EVA operations. Mm -hmm. So here we see uh, EVA um, and then EVR. This is like in the autonomous configuration. And uh, uh, here we see it in cooperative um, configuration with uh, an EVA astronaut wearing an XMU suite. 
so um, it, it obviously takes inspiration for them and you use it during the STS program. Uh, the only way, the only reason why we actually abandoned the menu was that we found that, um, that the Canada was uh, more effective uh, for um, most of the task, but though the problem is that there were not enough use cases for uh, this asset that was still very valid. Here we see an image of a satellite retrieval operation in 1984 performed at Julia, maybe. So the, the, how it works, the system. The, uh, we have, uh, like the idea is that you have, a, you deploy a service module uh, that can be attached to any existing or future spacecraft. Where an EDS port, and in this uh, this like model, it, it's um, configured as um, basically a, 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 a like robotic maintenance module. Uh, that it's also a, an airlock for a robot deployment. So there is the service module that arrive uh, and it's docked to, uh, as I said, to any spacecraft. And after there's a control station that is set inside the saved spacecraft that help uh, other crew members to control the additional limbs uh, provided by MMDR. And the, like the components of the system, this is like a modular robot. This is like a, the modular approach has some uh, um, advantages, also some of disadvantages, but in this case, what I needed was maximum flexibility, uh, and so I decided to go for um, uh, for uh, the modularity. So the, mod the uh, robot itself is composed by three main elements that are uh, two specular identical robots and a navigation model that perform the same uh, kind of operation that the MMU was doing in the 1980s, uh, but of course with updated technology. So here we see uh, one of the uh, robots that compose like the MMR. The robot can also uh, work by himself. The robot is uh, provide ten, uh, two tiny degree of freedom arms uh, for a, a precise operation. Uh, and it doesn't have a, a, its own propulsion, but it has a group of reaction with uh, that uh, allow him to or orientate. Um, to, to move around the station, it, it, it will use his own arms to climb around the station the same way that the astronaut does using the handles uh, that are um, leaving outside for radio operations. It's, um, uh, it's powered by two lithium ion batteries very back. Uh, and uh, at the end of the arm, there are two end factors that can be connected to a variety of tools that I designed as well. The second element is the nav module. The nav module is, as I said, it's a navigation module. It's like uh, perform the same kind of um, uh, tasks that the MM, uh, MMU was doing. So it provides uh, four orientable RCS units uh, and the two uh, and two tank that will basically help the astronaut to propel around uh, in space with an autonomy of kind of like six hours. It also uh, it's, it's provided with like eight docking ports that it helps him to dock with the uh, uh, with the, the astronaut backpack. So the the only things that an astronaut need to connect with the uh, with the um, MMEDR is this harness that is attached to the backpack of the suit. Uh, this because it is uh, the astronaut docking with the um, with the with an MMR and with the astronauts already outside microgravity, uh, because if they would mount themselves before that, there will not be enough space for the astronaut to, uh, to use the uh, uh, airlock door to go up. Um, so, and this is like uh, the set of tools that I designed uh, that the uh, Limbs that uh, can use uh, in an autonomous way. So there is an, like another uh, analysis clamp that uses uh, the NASA Gecko um, um, technology, and uh, uh, it's, it's used for the retrieval. Uh, there is a high density laser uh, that is uh, derived from um, the space shuttle program, um, and there is like a small. Uh, 
laser, de laser deposition uh, 3D printer that is used to repair, for example, small hole for debris impact. And there is an adaptive gripper that it's used for uh, uh, big, like to make like the arms compatible with the human rate tools like drills and screwdrivers. So how we, this is like the sequence that I was talking to you about before, the, the service model uh, uh, that I designed, and this uh, the deployed to any spacecraft using a SpaceX Dragon XL. And um, to deploy the robot, it opens in the same way that the Bishop Airlock does, uh, and uh, um, it reveals the robot that it's so deployed in space. The good thing is that this uh, this airlock can be used also for other functions, like to deploy uh, CubeSat or the payload, like already happens on the Japanese modular airlock on the ISS. So the robot self-assembly in space, and here we see it like in use um, in, in two different modes. And this is in, in the autonomous mode. In the autonomous mode, uh, an astronaut inside uh, will uh, uh, will control the robot. Here, it, this side we can uh, we can see it in a and augmented mode using one of only of the, the of the robots and an app module. So that's like to show you the modularity of, of the asset. This is like a first design uh, of, and this is something that we are working on uh, right now of the exoskeleton that used inside the station to control uh, the arms. So another crew member inside the station will cooperate with the crew member outside to control the additional limbs uh, of the robot. And uh, this is like a bit of the process that I'm going through right now. Uh, when I, like, I'm, I'm, the, I'm in the prototyping uh, part, so like um, I'm basically building the, the robot, at least like the first prototype. It's in a, uh, this is like the test uh, um, unit that I'm building right now together uh, at SIXA. Uh, and uh, it will be used to uh, test the human system integration together uh, using like wars uh, of war application. It's it's way more advanced than this slide. This slide is from some month ago, but uh, yes, this is let you understand how this prototype is currently built. And the last thing uh, that I will say about it is that of, uh, the human system integration is tested to uh, through a war application. Uh, so uh, I'm building uh, a war testing uh, uh, application that uh, will uh, include the idea to have to perform two different um, operations, like maintenance operation, uh, uh, using the lunar gateway as a as a possible scenario. So we will uh, use uh, both, uh, like the, the robot in the war to test how good it, how easy or difficult would be to interact. Uh, with the different hardware components uh, of the lunar gateway, and this is like the simulation overview. The, this uh, the two action to be performed is like swap one of the batteries on the Esprit module and repair one of the joints uh, on the Canada R3 um, on the lunar gateway. And that's it. I will stop here because I think that's my time finished. Thank you, Vittorio, so much. It was so insightful, really, and we wish we have uh, more time. I think there will be um, much more opportunities in the future, and we are glad that you shared with us your uh, insights today. Uh, our journey will carry our next presenter. Please, uh, Elif. Yeah. Our next presenter is Panam Bagley. Uh, she is co-founder of Nonfiction, a creative firm that turns science fiction into reality for a better future. Trained as an industrial designer and space architect, she creates cutting-edge hardware in wearables, biotech, healthcare, education, transportation, and aerospace. She specializes in turning groundbreaking technologies into attainable, intuitive, and beautiful products that help humans become the best version of themselves. Additionally, she is the co-host of Future Future, a video series that demystifies design and the future of everything. Thank you, Panam. The field is yours. Thank you, Elif. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So today's talk for me is going to be about making space more human. You know, based on uh, the, the bio that you just heard, you probably are already feeling this. 
Um, so I, uh, my aim in, in life, among many things, is to evolve the space industry. So let's start where it all started for me. When I was a kid, I was about 12 years old, and I was, I was living in France at the time. And uh, my American uh, cousin sends me two books, A Brief History of Time from uh, Professor uh, Stephen Hawking and Calvin and Hobbes. Um, so the, the book on the left, you probably all know about you know, origins of the universe and all that. And the one on the right is about um, this little boy who has an imaginary friend and they get into a lot of trouble together. And it was full of imagination and it was very uh, philosophical. And um, I, I would say that a lot of the way that I think about design and space architecture are based on these two books to this day. Um, and also, um, when I was a kid, there are two, uh, there are two um, specialties that I was interested in. One is astrophysics and the other one is art. And uh, I, I ended up, you know, doing not these two, but something very similar. So about 16 years ago, I moved to the U.S. Uh, to study at SICSA at the University of Houston, um, at the time the only master's program in uh, space architecture. And these are all the graduates from that year uh, in the world, uh, all four of us. So it was a very, very small program. There I worked on a lot of what I would call traditional space architecture. So, you know, systems, robotics, um, you know, rovers, pressurized um, rovers and hoppers and, and things of the sort. So about five years ago, I started a company called Nonfiction. And at first, what we did is that we designed a lot of physical products because I'm also trained as an industrial designer. An industrial designer is someone who designs physical products for mass manufacturing. They can be IOTs, they can be wearables, they can be systems of different kinds. But then eventually the company evolved into uh, something much bigger. What we do now is that we turn science fiction into reality for a better future. So historically, uh, we just celebrated the 60th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin uh, going to space. And back in the day, space was about uh, space exploration with humans was about surviving it. Right? You put in uh, the 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 uh, the systems that allowed him to go up to space to come back safely and to to live and breathe in between. And then now it's a lot, uh, when you look at the uh, ISS, for example, uh, its interior and how, how, how it's, it's put together, uh, it's about living in space. Um, people stay up there for weeks or months at a time and they have certain routines and, um, and a lot of work to be done up there. But what I'm very interested in is how we thrive in space. As we uh, elongate the, uh, the trips to the moon and Mars and, and beyond, we have to think about how us as humans, you know, become an interplanetary species, how we survive and thrive in an environment that is literally not designed for us to survive in. So I'd like to go a little bit over uh, transformational technology. So transformational technology is technology in uh, support of health, wellness, performance, and longevity. And that is the work that I've spent the last 15, 15 years uh, working on. So uh, we design you know, devices like this one. So this looks like a regular pair of headphones, but what it does really is that it uh, stimulates the motor cortex, which happens to be right underneath um, the um, uh, headphone band, and it helps the brain learn movement faster. So that has been used by here, you can see the USA team for uh, cycling using in their training, and that helps them shave off um, you know, micromilliseconds uh, off of their performance. We also work with sleep. As, as you know, sleeping in space can be a little problematic for, for a lot of astronauts. So we designed this product for Philips called Philips Smart Sleep uh, that helps basically get better quality deep sleep. Uh, so you put it on your head, uh, you sleep with it, it stimulates your brain using electricity. And uh, when you wake up in the morning, your mental acuity is a lot sharper. We also design uh, medical products of the sort. So this one is a wearable for people who suffer from essential tremors and Parkinson's disease. Uh, it takes uh, very uh, debilitating tremors and brings them down to something that's um, more manageable. So people can walk again, people can write again, people can use their phones again. We also completely revolutionize certain industries. So these are the first on-ear headphones 
without a band. So as you can imagine, connecting these headphones to human ears was quite difficult, but we're able to do it and now you can buy them. They're called human headphones. This is also a design that is an ode to natural design, which is something that's very important in the work that I do. We also work with firefighters designing AR uh, and thermal camera rigs that helps them uh, see through smoke. So basically as they are walking through an environment, you, uh, they can see the edges of everything, the ceiling, the walls, uh, fire, everything. So, so they can actually get in and out of environments of uh, dangerous environments much quicker. We also design educational systems like here for the country of Singapore, really developing creativity, imagination, lateral thinking uh, for, for young kids uh, at a young, uh, kids at a young age. We also allow them to, uh, to create their own furniture, which is uh, something that when you think about the future of humans in space would be very useful uh, for, for people to be able to create their own environments as they go. We also design insides of airlines, completely redefining what comforts first class and multi-sensory experiences mean. You know, what if we transform lavatories into spas? Why not? We also design transportation system here for the city of Nashville, Tennessee, integrating a lot of natural materials and all that the city represents in terms of its history with music and, uh, and the nature that is around. We also work in soft robotics and um, agriculture. We also work with the future of food, uh, uh, creating you know, molds and, and, uh, and types of foods that um, you know, are, are vegan based and, uh, and, and save a little bit of the, the water consumption that we have out there. Uh, we're also involved in multi-sensory experiences. This is um, a device uh, it's, it's a pod where you lay in, you experience uh, vibroacoustics uh, to, to, to relax, aromatherapy, VR, you have winds going through your hair and, and really create this uh, higher level of consciousness uh, by, by just sitting in there for like, for like about 20 minutes. We're also currently um, uh, working uh, in integrating psychedelics. Uh, for, um, for the treatment of uh, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. We'll also host a material library here at the office. Um, and a lot of these materials are super high performance and or uh, based on natural renewable energies. So, um, so here we're here to talk about humans in, uh, in space um, and, and really you know, thinking about uh, bringing humanity to the moon was, was a question that we asked ourselves here at the office. So this is what the moon looks like. This is also what it looks like. And this is what it looks like. So as you can see, it's a lot of gray. So what we wanted to do is to bring color to the moon. Color is something that is very uh, you know, prominent uh, in nature and also prominent in the way we construct the life that is around us. We surround ourselves with the products, materials, uh, shapes, and, and textures that make us feel comfortable. And so we wanted to integrate color psychology in the way we designed our future as humans on the moon. So what's wonderful about color psychology is that you can affect the mood and the emotions of humans uh, individually or as a group by just integrating certain colors. These colors, we can, they can be on the products themselves, they can be projection mapping uh, or, or different kinds of technologies. So here for the moon, we, we wanted to integrate it in an in underground structure um, you know, um, suitable uh, to, to, to living in a, in a lava tube, for example, uh, which are natural uh, structures on the moon that can help protect from uh, very dangerous radiations, as well as extreme um, shifts in temperature. And so as you can see, integration of colors and of harmony between these colors um, everywhere in, in the environment. We also integrate uh, some, some nature and, uh, and make sure that the, uh, the astronauts have access to, to machinery that helps them create the interior that actually works for them. Also private space, right? Instead of having a boring white uh, bland um, uh, interior, you can customize it with colors and textures and, and shapes and furniture that actually works for you. Uh, we also uh, integrate uh, something that we call new nature. So it's artificial uh, parts 
um, uh, or, or interior details that are reminiscent of nature. Perhaps the ceiling is not flat and boring. Perhaps it has little, little hills of grass-like environments uh, that are enhanced by projection mapping. Perhaps you have elements left and right that are more randomized and uh, create this um, you know, more natural environment that you really wanna sit on, touch and, uh, and, and be around. Even working out, right? What if working out was not, you know, in a in a using machines that are just, you know, tubes and and uh, and components put together, but makes you feel like you're running in in nature. And uh, same thing for for decoration all around the, the station. But really, you know, bringing color to the moon, this grayscale environment of the moon is sort of a symbolic imprint of humanity on, on our, our, our system moon. And then giving the opportunity to astronauts to enjoy the, the, the landscape of the moon in environments where they, they can look out and see the contrast between what makes us alive and what uh, this new environment is about. So to finish this, uh, this presentation, I'd like to go over why we go to space. So we go to space because we, we have to invent a lot of innovation up there in order to bring them back to earth and serve people, right? Uh, that is actually uh, the, the main mission of NASA if, if you really research it. So, so here are some few examples of the things that we use commonly on planet earth that actually come from space um, innovation. So prosthetics, um, some monitors for the body, you know, LASIK, uh, Bluetooth headsets, um, uh, water filtration systems, um, 3D printed food, uh, solar panels, et cetera. One of the thought experiments that we did here, uh, and actually Michal, who, who's also going to present in a few minutes was, was a participant, is uh, to think about the psychology, the sociology and, and happiness uh, on Mars in the future, right? In, in a matter of decades, we're, we're gonna start going there. And soon, uh, the astronauts, the highly trained astronauts that we have today are going to uh, slowly become people like you and me. People are not, you know, superhumans, people who have uh, good days and bad days and people who have, um, you know, uh, perhaps spiritual uh, background. So, so we wanted to put in a room a, um, a spiritual guide, a psychologist, a planetary colonization agnostic, so meaning some, someone who doesn't really believe we should go to Mars beyond you know, scientific exploration, uh, the architect, which was Michal. And uh, we had a future Martian, which, uh, which was a seven-year-old boy who, who loved space, right? And we asked uh, questions about what it meant for them to be, to be happy on Mars. And we got pretty deep into, into um, um, you know, the meaning of what it, what it is to be human and how we can export that to another place. So in October of 2020, uh, I participated uh, in a uh, event with the WDO, the World Design Organization in the ISS National Laboratory called Design in Space for Life on Earth. And what, uh, what we did was uh, to design an orbital university. So here's a, <clears throat> uh, the design that we came up in you know, in like three days. Um, so basically it's a, it's a, it's a university uh, divided in uh, three different rings that uh, represent, um, <clears throat> represent uh, different um, disciplines that could be experimented up in microgravity. So um, one ring represents um, uh, STEM, right? Um, like science and engineering, math and all that. Um, and uh, one ring represented the humanities, so the arts, law, all of, uh, all of these disciplines. And uh, the third ring was fo focused on social science, right, which is going to be more and more important to develop um, uh, when, when we go, when we're going to space for longer uh, durations. And, uh, and at the center, we have kind of like an arena where people can, uh, can, can talk uh, can, can connect and uh, perhaps play sports. So one thing that's very important here uh, while developing um, you know, the future of food or biology is to think about aromas and think about what makes um, the food that we eat on earth so, so pleasurable and so linked to our culture. So we, we focused our story on this biology teacher who's you know, uh, growing food and really re-injecting uh, re aromas and flavors into the food in space. Um, 
also integrating art in space. There's this uh, artist, uh, Japanese artist Azuma Makoto, who is sending uh, flowers and plants up in space uh, and, and is you know, collecting these beautiful, beautiful pictures of what it looks like to, to have um, uh, nature at the edge of an atmosphere. So here, you know, in art, what we wanted to do is how do we create art studios in space where we can take advantage of microgravity to create yet another level of expression and, and uh, interaction and, uh, for, 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 for people uh, in art. So the overview effect is quite important here. So the overview effect for the ones who don't know is uh, the, the cognitive shift that happens when astronauts go to space and uh, see that Earth is this you know, blue uh, small ball in the, in the universe that is extremely fragile. And uh, what happens is that a lot of these astronauts get that, get that shift, come back to Earth and, and, and spend a lot of time and effort uh, trying to protect uh, and inspire people to protect that, that planet. So, um, and, and, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, connection with, with, um, with, with the arts in the way to do that. So the way, a lot of the work that we do at my company, Nonfiction, is really aligning uh, sustainability and social impact in everything that we do. So one of the requirements to work with us is to align with at least one of the, the United Nations uh, sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them, you know, some having to do with education, some having to do with poverty, with equality, uh, with uh, the way we treat our planet. We also have a great uh, co um, collaboration with Material Connections that uh, supplants, uh, supports us with material science, as well as the material library that I talked about earlier. And then we're also connected to MIT Solve, which is um, kind of like an accelerator program uh, connected to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, that focuses primarily on social impact all over the world. And so why are we designing for space? We're designing for people like this girl uh, who lives uh, you know, in rural India. She wants to uh, support her family, support her community and use the technology that we're developing up in space uh, in order to, to, to do all of this. We need to open space to more people than the, uh, the elite. And I'm very excited about the world that we live in that allows us to do that open conversation. Um, you know, um, develop more, um, uh, develops education in STEM and other uh, disciplines related to space for these young kids to have a chance in, in being us in the future and perhaps go to the moon, go to Mars and go beyond. That is it for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ufnam. I'm really amazed uh, with, the, with the work you have done and the research and you, you have succeeded in to uh, you know, ending the journey into a product <clears throat> that is already in the market, that is amazing. So thank you so much for this uh, insights. And uh, now we will continue our journey with the next speaker. So please, Elif, can you introduce us to her? Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks a lot for the nice presentation. And uh, our next presenter is Michal Ziso. Uh, Michal Ziso is the founder of Ziso a studio working at the intersection of architecture, innovation, space, and human equality. She is also a space architect focused on human experience, a trailblazer by dealing with social and psychological diversity aspects. Michal is two times uh, TEDx speaker. Uh, one of it is TEDx US, uh, ISU and uh, TEDx Jaffa Women and a frequent speaker at academic institution, organization, and creative tech companies. A visionary architect practicing for almost a decade in Israel and New York City. She has extensive experience in designing skyscrapers and large-scale urban projects. She is a, he, she is a graduate of uh, the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. She also served in the Elite Intelligence Unit 8200 of the IDF. Taken together is a combination of creative skills, the intelligence of data analysis, and technical abilities which she manifests as a space architect and through leader. Thanks a lot. The field is yours, uh, Michal. Thank you so much for introducing me. I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, um, so thank you again. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. 
Um, as Elif said, I'm Michal Ziso. I'm an architect, futurist, entrepreneur, and the founder of Ziso. Um, it's very um, uh, interesting that I'm right after Fanam. Uh, she kind of tied it right in her end of the presentation. I wanted to tell you that the studio was selected in 2019 uh, by the UN SDG Action Campaign to be one of 10 um, uh, leading initiatives that promote gender equality. Um, so this, uh, and they used us in their campaign in 2019. So this is very exciting. Uh, and so what I do in my studio uh, are trying to do stemmed from this question. Uh, what is the single most common design flaw of human history? It affects everything we have ever built and its consequences are felt by more than half of the world population. Most of us don't really notice it. So the answer to this question is that we usually are taught to design for averages. And in reality, average doesn't represent everybody. When I studied architecture and when I started to work as an architect, um, I learned that different people use the space around us, the physical space around us in different ways. Now, when our world around us was, was designed, its infrastructure was designed in times of maybe different social structures, it was designed by very similar people. They were usually male and white and um, abled uh, and came from a specific socioeconomic group. So as humans, when we are experiencing life and then we need to do something to create something for someone else who has a completely different experience than us, sometimes we find it hard. We, use, we are used to act from what we know. And when we do that, something happens and it is called discrimination by design. And this is kind of where my approach to space architecture comes from. Um, um, it's more from, like Alif said, from the psychological um, aspects. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. Uh, from the psychological aspects and, um, and also the human experience and social uh, backgrounds of the people that are uh, using the space that we design. So just to get a brief kind of overview, uh, as architecture students, uh, we are taught to uh, look at body proportions. Uh, on the left, we see the Vitruvian man uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. And on the right, we see the Modulor by Le Corbusier, who is one of the greatest architects um, of uh, the 50s. And um, these proportions are not showing really average. They are showing men, they're showing tall, muscular men with large hand, hand spans. And when we design for these proportions, we really don't design for everyone. So this is an, uh, one example of it. And I like to show it because it's very kind of screaming at you. So these are um, uh, crash, crash test dummies that car companies are using to test the safety of their cars. And in the middle, there is a woman a uh, very normal sized woman. Uh, and you can see how small she is compared to these uh, dummies. And what happens is research shows that when women get into car accidents, they get injured much more severely than men because they may be sitting closer to the wheel uh, because they're shorter or the seat belts were not really designed for uh, female anatomy, let alone pregnant bellies. So this is one example. Another example, which is very interesting, are these bridges. Uh, they were designed by an architect called Robert Moses uh, in New York, and they are bridges from Manhattan to Long Island. And you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the sign that says low clearance. Now, Moses designed these bridges especially low on purpose. He didn't want buses to come uh, through these bridges. And low income people that don't have car, private cars, they rely on public transportation and buses to move around. And when Moses designed these um, bridges low, he actually prevented a whole group of people from going to these more luxurious areas of the city. And the last example that I wanna show you are these stairs that probably most of you are familiar with, the glass staircases of the Apple stores. Um, and they're amazing and beautiful 
But anyone who's not wearing uh, pants, who's wearing a dress or a skirt or anything else, uh, can find this experience going down these stairs not so modest. Uh, and some of us don't really even notice it when we do go down these stairs. But this is something important to, to think about when we design. So for me personally, I wanted to combine what I know, which is architecture, and what I care about, which is equality. Now, after I realized that the majority of our world was designed in times of different social structure, and that a lot of things didn't really change as uh, things um, on other realms outside of architecture progressed, I started uh, looking at the concept of time. And I, like Summer said in the very, very beginning of uh, our talk today, we uh, and the world around us changes exponentially. That means that every day, the amount of change that happens is double the amount of change that happened yesterday. We as humans, we tend to think about our lives in a linear way. What happened is what is going to happen. And the delta between where we think we'll end up in the future and when, where we actually end up in the future, that's the exponential growth surprise factor. Now, um, think about just what happened to us from January 2020, when we woke up in the morning and everything was fine, until January 2021, so much has changed. And this is an amazing example of the exponential growth. So my conclusion from this uh, introduction was that the world changes very, very fast. And architecture changes very, very slow. So for me, space was a way to kind of bridge this gap to kind of think of how can we design from completely new without relying on existing infrastructure? How can we design uh, in times of more equality, of more people having the rights for their physical space on earth and in actual outer space? Uh, and, and that way, um, it also helps me and my team to understand how can we prepare for earth's future? So our mission in my studio is not to make the same mistake again when we are talking about space architecture. Also doing that while creating a constant, constant updates of what we have here on earth using that space architecture. So the first shift that I did from earth to space was to Mars. Uh, and I uh, joined an international competition set to design a settlement on Mars. And I thought this was an amazing opportunity for me to explore what equality driven architecture could look like. So this was my uh, project and my uh, structure that I presented. The project was called uh, Mars is More because I believe that it just is. Uh, and I used these circular ring shaped structures. And the reason I did that, and that's how I based the entire settlement the reason I did that was because when I looked back, I learned that those round shapes really promote equality. If we think about our um, joint um, um, collective memory, if we think about how we sit around a campfire or sit around a table, usually it's a very equal way to organize ourselves. It is also a very safe way to create uh, uh, settlements because we don't have corners. We can always see what danger is coming. Uh, and if we think about how cities like Paris or Milan were designed, they are also have a kind of circular wall around them for this exact reason. Now, if I place these structures on a grid, on a circular 30 degree uh, grid, I created a certain um, map that has uh, more safe qualities. If we look at regular cities on earth, like London, for example, we have a lot of dead ends. We have a lot of dangerous areas. And if we look at Pac-Man here, whenever uh, it approaches uh, somewhere dangerous, a dead end or a bridge, we, I put those cherries just to make sure that we notice these uh, unsafe areas. And on my Martian settlement, there are actually absolutely no dead ends. So in that sense, it's a much more safer way to settle. Another thing is that um, in terms of functions, I placed the public functions in the center and the public, the residentials are around it. So we always have eyes on what's happening in the center. So again, it's much safer, much more safe. So when I shifted my mindset from problem solving mode on earth to actually using the opportunities that the different extreme environments on Mars uh, is giving me, I found that I could design more creatively and the actual lack of resources and extreme conditions we have in space is what propels innovation. 
So for my little equation that I showed you before, I added for what I knew and what I cared about in the center, I needed something, I needed a disruption mediator. For me, it is space uh, or innovation that comes from space. And actually earth today is becoming more like space than we realize. Um, if it's on Mars or in the moon or in the International Space Station for researching or living or space tourism, there are challenges that we're dealing in space today that are kind of where earth is going towards. Uh, think about if we're trying to design uh, areas to live in, they need to be small enough in space so we'll be able to control the artificial environment inside of them. On Earth, we are going towards co-era, co-living, co-transportation, co-working, and our private areas are getting smaller and smaller and we have to, during the day, learn how to cope with other people around us. So different people have different kind of sense of their personal space. Uh, a lot of people are comfortable with people being close to them. Others need people to be more at a distance. So this is something that when we are designing for space right now, uh, helps us to design for the future of design on earth. In my studio, we design for desirable futures. These are a few with and without gravity uh, projects that we are doing. And um, we are kind of approaching this from the understanding that the built environment really can affect how we behave, what are our choices and our feelings, and therefore designing with equality in mind can maximize the human experience in space and on earth. So the first project or the main project that I wanted to show you and to talk to you about today is this, it is called Puha. It's a structure we designed uh, myself, my team, and a team from Milan, Italy, uh, from a studio called Pixel. Uh, we designed it for Burning Man, actually, in the Nevada desert. And this structure, um, is the, its idea is to um, create a closed cycle architecture. And for this uh, specific purpose we designed for Nevada desert, it can function on uh, the North Pole or even on Mars, and I'll explain in a minute how it works. Uh, so it's a closed cycle architecture that means that it only relies on its, its own resources. It can produce its own energy. It can produce its own food through, uh, in this case, um, a greenhouse, a hydroponic greenhouse. Uh, it can produce its own light, its own heat and cooling systems and even music and also purify its water. So we used a system uh, based on we call it the Arduino approach of rings that can we can actually add and remove according to the area where we place this structure. So if we place it in a desert, we have many um, solar rings that can produce energy from uh, the sun. But if we put it in a more windy area, we can use rings that produce energy from the wind or from a water movement and so on. Something that was very important to us was also to create an option for this structure to close down as a shelter if we need it. So here uh, in particular, we thought to use uh, a special fabric uh, that is uh, now being developed by NASA. It's kind of like scales that can also prevent uh, radiation from coming in. And another idea that uh, we had in mind and was very important for us is, although we're using the specific environment to create energy, we want to save that energy as much as possible. So if we can, from people's movement, physical action, uh, if we can um, uh, use them uh, to do things instead of the mechanical uh, options we have, we would like to do that. So here we see the people walking up to the um, uh, greenhouse or along the greenhouse, and we used very simple foot pumps that the people can kind of bring the, the water up the stairs as they go up. Uh, if you can see, we have here uh, three sets of hand railings uh, fit for three different types of height and sizes of hands. And on those railings, there is braille writing that only visually impaired or people that know how to read braille can understand secret messages. So we actually think about um, having different abilities or people with different abilities, uh, helping them feel welcome so they'll know that they have not only regular generic, you know, um, signals from us, but actually can have another layer of interaction with our structure. Uh, the center circle here in the middle 
is our main solar panel, but it's also something, it's a panel that can generate energy from people's movement. So one of the guidelines for living in this structure is that people have to dance about two hours a day in order to produce uh, extra energy. So this way we can see that um, the architecture can really control or can really um, set the tone to how the people behave uh, around our structure. The mist over here that you see, that's the um, ring that kind of lowers down the temperature of the desert. The black ring here is another solar ring that is in a 32 degree angle, which is a perfect angle for uh, um, producing that energy from uh, the sun. And another uh, two things that I just wanna quickly touch upon before I finish are these two researches that we're doing now in the studio. One is the space habitability research. And we are looking into um, a lot of um, analog habitats that we have today around the world on Earth that where um, we are doing experiments to actually test how we can live on the moon or on Mars in analog environments in environments that are um, kind of resembling uh, uh, things that we have on the moon or on Mars. And we saw interesting things there. We saw that missions that are longer durations, these missions can uh, go from two days to two months to even two years. And we found that the longer the mission, the less women are joining them. So that's something very, very interesting. Another thing that we found is that acoustics is very, very, are very important for the people living in the habitat, uh, because if we, they don't have the right acoustics, they don't feel that they have their privacy. And another um, research that we are looking into is how we can transform earthly disabilities into space superpowers. So on Earth, um, we have, for example, uh, Paralympic athletes. There are people that can be very, very healthy, but maybe they're amputees, they don't have legs. These people can be amazing astronauts because on the ISS, the International Space Station, the astronauts actually don't use their legs. They use their hands to move around. And these uh, Paralympic athletes weigh maybe less because they don't have their legs. So it's easier, or it's cheaper maybe to fly them there. And I know it's kind of controversial to think about it in this sense, but I talked to people from the uh, European Space Agency about six months ago about our research and we kind of discussed this. And I'm happy to say that about a month ago, the European Space Agency launched its program, its para-astronauts program, uh, that they are looking for uh, exactly those kinds of uh, people with those disabilities, motoric vis uh, disabilities specifically, uh, to join their astronauts crew or astronauts training. Uh, we are looking into physical disabilities, mental and sensory disabilities. So to sum up um, my short presentation here, uh, we really look at space as a way to, one, try to think about not doing the same mistakes we did here, understanding that the world changes very, very fast, uh, and we have to fit it to a variety of people or to fit the environments that we are designing to a variety of people, and also to use space and, as a way to kind of design for our own future back here on Earth. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mikal. Uh, I'm really impressed by the quality of the project presented today. I feel really lucky for having you all uh, today and really sharing the experience with you. So I think uh, it might be my turn now. I hope that uh, I'm up to, to the standards of what I have so, seen uh, just uh, minutes ago. So I'll let Elif just give an idea and I'll start my presentation after. Yeah, thank you, Michal. I really loved the idea of dancing two hours a day for producing energy. And uh, our next presenter is Samar al Sayari, is an assistant professor of architecture, researcher, and award winning architect with a special passion of other space architecture. Uh, he has graduated in 2001 with honor of being top student of his class. And through the years, he received many national and international 38 awards from four different continents. His works are exhibited in several countries, including NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, MedCup 21 France, Greece, Tunisia, Egypt, Malaysia, among many several other countries. His works also have been featured in Discovery Channel UK documentary, Wired magazine, and Larka magazine, Architecture de Jour special edi edition 2021, 
designboom.com, archdaily.com, spacearchitect.org, among many others. Dr. El Sayari was invited as a guest speaker delivering public talks in numerous venues as AIAA uh, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, TEDx Bau, Idea X Me Radio UK, Crew Central Asia, among many others. In addition to being invited as a keynote speaker in several conferences, he made TV interviews in six different countries and also published several scientific papers, including Q1 journals and reputable international conferences after turning his hours into scientific research. Thank you. This field is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. So let me uh, grab the thread here from what you guys have started already. Uh, my work here is uh, an unfinished work. It's a work in progress that I have started maybe seven years ago, and it's uh, still ongoing. Uh, my approach of designing space communities is about a new uh, re-understanding and rethinking the human-centered design. I rather would like to call it a community-centered design. It's dealing much more with a social imperative or the living or preferring to live in a community rather than uh, alone. So what I'll be presenting today <coughs> is considering consideration of the user as a member of the design, be, uh, design team. It's also a third phase colonization prototype, not only for the near future missions, but also to leave mankind legacy for future generations, just as our, just as, uh, our ancestors did to us. So my design manifesto, I would like to start with Le Corbusier, the father of the modern architecture. He said, you know, it's always life that is right and the architect who is wrong. We have to work with the law of nature. And I do also believe that divine rules are design rules. So we are learning <coughs> and teaching the design from what we have learned from nature. So what is the purpose as a science tech? And uh, I, uh, uh, it's a new invented word. Space architecture will serve mankind on earth before it does in space, if we have plans for the Mars terraforming, that, that, that also means that we have plans uh, to reverse the climate change. So across three main countries from Los Angeles to Paris to Kuala Lumpur, this is the timeline and uh, of the projects that I'll be presenting today. So what is the design manifesto that I'll be presenting? It's about three steps, community-centered design. First of all, I'll be uh, working about emulation of the models, systems, elements of nature for the purpose of solving complex space architecture challenges using parametric digital strategies. Number two is experimenting and developing those values and strengths using cutting edge technologies to create a state of art design that carries the spirit of the past, not its shape or form, but in experience. And third, documenting those experiments through publishing projects and papers as a proof of our current legacy delivered to our future generations. Let me start with the Project Oasis. Project Oasis started in 2018, exactly. It was inspired <clears throat> by several images from nature. The sophisticated engineering of the ant and termites colonies that uh, can really stand all kind of existential risks and still the residents of this colony can survive. The oasis, which is something that is hardwired in the extreme environment culture and how people can gather <clears throat> surrounding the source of water and start a new life. And the psychology of the circle. The psychology of the circle is also embedded inside us. When you, even in our uh, expressions, daily expressions, we say the circle of family, the circle of friends, the circle of trust. So it is something in our in our uh, culture. The chosen site of this colony with a philatelic crater uh, based on a study conducted by the uh, Purdue University with the size of this uh, uh, lava tube. I started reconstructing the lava tube and start <clears throat> understanding the tectonics and the geography and the dimensions to start embedding a, a line of colonies starting with uh, the Oasis project. So each colony will be designed to host the number of minimum viable population from 150 to 200 individual. The group uh, that can reverse any existing extinction level event and start civilization again. The organic lines that stimulates creativity, motivation, intuition, tranquility also are included in the design. The colony is divided later on into eight sectors, eight isolated sectors. 
each sector with an independent engineering system to mitigate any existential risk like the viral pandemics or contagious microbial life forms. Form meaning also is important, is as important as form reasoning, while engineers prefer circular and fillet, filleted edges in the space to resist the internal pressure of the pressurized habitats. It was all it all carries values that can change people to better people, make better spaces and buildings that can motivate people. The use of the circular geometry here, I used it to create a silent language between the occupant and the architect. The circle implies, as I mentioned earlier, the unity, the commitment, the love, community. It represents life and the never-ending cycle of it. The form meaning holds here with the intangible design parameters that communicates with our psychology and mental well-being. It gives meaning to things. It provides explanation to our visually perceived images. It maintains balance between our physical state and psychological well-being. The power, the power was something important in the colony. So I have chosen to diversify between the sources of power. The first uh, source of power, which will be used more in the construction phase, is the solar satellites that will be gathering all of the energy, solar energy from the orbital geosynchronous orbital of the moon, and then start beaming it to the chosen site. While <clears throat> once the, the uh, astronauts had landed and the the life had started in the colonization. The activation of the lightweight nuclear submarine sized reactor, uh, light, uh, small size uh, nuclear reactor, the one that is used much more in the submarines and the ice breakers, will be activated to start running the colony. And later on, as uh, Michal maybe mentioned earlier, I also depended on the piezoelectric floor tiling to just uh, in, uh, encourage and urge people to start their physical training and gaining the uh, much more energy at the same time. So it's working on a two-way. Also the concept of the clean zone, due to the lack of the atmosphere in the uh, moon or lunar environment, there is no chance for a wind. So we decided in the design to make a, an internal clear zone out of the dust, just to be a safe, safer zone for the astronauts to start uh, running, to start experiencing the lunar uh, environment to start getting out of the structure just to eliminate the, the uh, uh, all kind of phobias the you know the narrow places the phobia of the narrow places and stuff like that they have to get out at some time the robotics also will be in a continuous ma maintenance process just making sure that everything is all right and there is no cracking or something also uh, all monitored and giving an internal overview from uh, the openings of the lava cave, lava tube to earth. And in, in 2020, at the early 2020, I was contacted by the uh, representative of government of uh, one of the Gulf states that were interested in the project and start making blueprints for uh, an analog ver version of this uh, Oasis project in the desert of that country. Well, still, it's a work in progress. I can't reveal any more about it, but later on, it was uh, developed to be not just an analog representing what will be built on moon, but to be a virtual twin using the mixed reality uh, technology to work and to experience what will be done and to start training astronauts. And at the same time, it will be the meeting ground between the version that will be built, built on moon later on and the other what will be built on Earth. So people on the moon and on the Earth on the same twin colonies can meet and start um, greeting their relatives and meeting their friends and socializing with others, even if the miles are separating them away. Later on in 2019, another version of the uh, Oasis project was developed for the Martian environment. And uh, of course, a lot of parameters has changed. We have now pressure. Uh, we have a different pressure. We have different uh, thermal pattern analysis. We have different wind. And we have a different kind of dust even. The dust on the lunar regolith is uh, much more different from, from that on the Martian. So taking all of these parameters together and start designing the another Martian oasis. These are the two different versions, the lunar and the Martian oasis. And the Martian oasis used uh, a lot of technologies. Even the piezoelectric effect was used outside to harness the power of the wind and uh, many calculations were considered under the supervision, of course, of our uh, senior NASA engineers while I was uh, in the Los Angeles in 2017 and start developing 
the tree of life project that one at the middle the tree that is uh, covered in a pneumatic structure and covered with all fins that will be generating the energy and feeding the uh, the input the light input necessary for these trees when uh, the martian devils or the martian wind blocks the sun for six months or for several months it can still survive adapting to the martian harsh environment the time plan also were considered to start building for uh, in four phases five years time span starting from the selecting of the uh, creator and then start deploying the solar array and uh, uh, identifying the cardinal uh, directions on mars and this is an approach that were used in our ancient ancestor civilizations the cosmogenesis approach as well and then start in phase three in boring and uh, making the underground settlement and in the final phase the final for the fourth phase while we will be deploying our robotic construction uh, vehicles and start 3d printing the whole structure This is a very singular item of uh, the Martian environment, which is called Tree of Life. Tree of Life is depending majorly on the piezoelectric uh, effect. The piezoelectric effect using the vibrations conducted by the wind to generate electricity. It's a very simple and very cheap and low cost solution here on earth, and you can use it in a variety of ways. And the first Tree of Life also adapted and designed for the Martian environment were created. Later on, it was developed and inspired by the movement of the grass and start print and start sketching the first concepts until the piezoelectric power tree of life was born. It will be an integral part and one mobile unit that will be relocated for uh, for uh, optimization and adaptation for the best location to have the sun and in the case of the sun blockage it will be generating electricity from this blue fins that you can see and this blue fins are uh, also a memory shaped alloys that will be expanded once this capsule will be deployed on the martian surface to start operating on its own and in full automation method start also we have a uh, in 2017, uh, part of the award that I was awarded is uh, testing the ground and the land in Mojave Desert that we will be building the first prototype. Thank you all. I had the pleasure today to present and share my work with you all guys. And I hope I didn't uh, take uh, uh, so long. So we are on the, our schedule. And I will leave the field now for Elif to introduce you to the next uh, guest speaker. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Our next guest is Barbara Belvisi. Barbara Belvisi is an entrepreneur passionate about science, space, and artificial intelligence. She is the founder and CEO at the Interstellar Lab, which develops environmentally controlled modules for sustainable living on Earth and in space. She started her career at 23 as an investor, raised over $80 million, and participated in 40 deals. At 28, she helped launch the family, a Paris-based incubator, and Hello Tomorrow, an event fostering scientific innovation. The same year, she founded her asset management firm, which gave birth in 2015 to Hardware Club, a $50 million hybrid fund dedicated to robotics and hardware startups with over 400 startups worldwide. The youngest woman founder of Venture Capital Fund in Europe. She is in the top 10 women in tech in France and the world top 100 of Forbes in 2018. Thanks a lot. The field is yours, Barbara, do you hear? Yes, hi, hello. Uh, do you hear me? I'm very happy to be here. Uh, amazing work, uh, uh, guys, uh, what, you're, what you're doing. Uh, it's very, very impressive. Uh, you're uh, super talented. Um, I, uh, so I'm not an architect by training. I'm not an engineer by training. Um, as, a, uh, as I was uh, introduced, I was um, uh, 
coming from the from the investor world, and I invested in a lot of entrepreneurs and, and uh, helping them transforming their ideas in you know in, into real product. Uh, but uh, um, five years ago, I decided to you know move to the other side um, and uh, and start building stuff myself. Um, so I'm gonna share presentation about uh, uh, what we're doing at uh, Interstellar. Alors, hop, I can move full screen. I don't know how to do that here. Oh, if you apply to this command. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, uh, um, so at uh, Interstellar Lab, so we're a startup, we're a young startup, um, starting in uh, uh, September 2018. Um, and, um, and our mission is to help to build a bioregenerative bio world. Um, we're trying to um, uh, integrate technology with nature uh, to build a world where biology and life will thrive um, and, and to do that in a regenerative way. So trying to close the loop and, and not to break the circle as you know, humans have been very good breaking the circle of, of life of, <laughs> since, since, we, since we're on Earth. Um, so, so basically, our uh, our mission and and, uh, and, uh, and 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 what we do in this company is to is to design and to build uh, uh, pods, um, so small modules um, for sustainable living on Earth and in space. So we we using we using a lot of space approach, space design, space technology uh, to to build product that will first have a use case on on Earth and trying to bring solution, especially regarding food production. Um, and 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 our goal is to iterate on the system we develop here, so we can have something that is you know, dedicated to space and, and eventually that we'll be able to put on the moon and in a further future on, on Mars. Um, so so the, the product that we're developing are uh, environmentally controlled module uh, where we can we can grow food, we can uh, while recycling the air, the water and the waste. So everything is completely conceptualized as a as a closed system, uh, sealed and separated from the outside world. Um, so this is where we took uh, the, uh, inspiration from space and basically how we can survive in very you know harsh environments um, and, and recreate those shelters to protect um, uh, life uh, and to create places where human and, 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 uh, and nature uh, uh, can live in harmony. Um, and uh, and so the way we, we we design all of it is uh, is um, um, so so we started first uh, by um, uh, by building a, um, a simulation um, uh, what is called the Eclipse simulation so an, an event, environmentally controlled life support system simulation uh, where we took the number of people we did, we estimated what they need to eat how much you know energy they will use how much O2 and CO2 they will uh, reject how much CO2 will be needed for the plants to grow and and how much plants do you need to fulfill all the nutritional and and, uh, and psychological requirements of, of these people um, and so we, we we design we designed this module to be um, uh, to be able to operate as standalone buds but also to work together to operate as standalone so we can have use cases on earth because there is no need right now on earth to be completely isolated from the outside world uh, but also so they can they can be plugged in together uh, and, and and form basically a, a, a station um, and the station we call it eBIOS which stands for uh, experimental bioregenerative station um, uh, it's it's completely modular you can assemble uh, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, but I think we are still on the first page. Do you change the slide? Oh, yes, yeah. I did. Yeah, we are still on the first page, so we didn't we didn't see the rest of the pictures and presentations. Okay, I'm sorry about that. On my screen is changing. Yeah, still on the maybe page. it would be a good idea the, to unshare and share the screen again. Yes, maybe might, again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is better if you share desktop and you can see everything if you yeah. change. May, maybe okay i will do that okay sorry about that thank you for <laughs> it's okay Tag, share screen and it doesn't i don't know if it's okay hello otherwise i will keep it like this can you see now yes can you just start from the beginning yes hello Okay, yeah, that's okay. it. So, so, so what I was, so, uh, I, I will do it. I will do it uh, fast. Try to not to uh, to um, to ruin the schedule because everybody was on schedule. Um, and so, so, so designing pods for sustainable living on Earth and in space. 
Uh, this is um, uh, this is the module I was explaining uh, um, and how we conceptualize. We call them flowers, actually, those modules, uh, because they design, as you can see, there is a center, a core center, and there are the different petals uh, that represent the different buds and the different units. And we design it so they can work completely standalone. So they are they are by themselves, they are environmentally controlled system, and, and they have a and they have an integrated uh, uh, technology, hardware, software, so they can they can just support themselves, but also they can work and be plugged in uh, all together. So we had a very Lego type approach where we design, you know, a, a similar airlock for for all of the for all the pods, so they can be connected together and form uh, what we call so this uh, this module, this station, which is called um, uh, which is called the BIOS. Um, and so it's an experimental bioregative station. And uh, what you can see here is, so the different module and the habitat and the connect connector section. So to dive a little bit more into um, uh, how we conceptualize those, uh, uh, those modules. Um, so you have an aeroponics unit. Um, we, we make the choice to, to go for aeroponics because it's a very um, it's a sustainable way of growing plants. Uh, it re requires much less water than, uh, than the hydroponic. Uh, it's much healthier for the plants, um, and especially because, because you don't put uh, uh, too much water into the roots of the plants, and, and so you, you have less, less moisture. Um, and and it's, a, it's a very good way to control environmental agriculture. So one unit is dedicated to food production. This is the aeroponics unit. Um, this module in particular is designed for, um, uh, for a group of uh, 10 people, um, and the and total surface, ground surface, is around seven, um, um, seven square meter. Uh, each module, each pod, uh, is uh, around 120. Um, so this is the air opening unit. This is the greenhouse unit. So the greenhouse has two purposes. Uh, one purpose is to grow the, the fruit trees, because fruit trees, they don't like to grow in air openings. Um, so we needed to design a soil base. It's more a substrate base, actually, greenhouse. Uh, but it also serves a second purpose, which is um, uh, um, connecting human backs to nature. Because if you think about living, you know, off planet and 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 be put out of Earth, there is this this question of, you know, how are we connected with nature? Uh, and humans need nature to to feel uh, uh, to feel happy <laughs> and to feel good. Um, and so the greenhouse also fulfills all the psychological um, uh, needs that human will have when they will live uh, off planet. Um, the last, uh, the last um, uh, dome um, um, designed the same way. So the three first dome are really designed the same way with a composite base and then an inflatable membrane and an airlock. Uh, the inflatable membrane is a combination of several materials, PTFE, TFE, and aerogel. Uh, and the last unit is a, water, uh, is a treatment unit, the waste management unit. Uh, and this is mostly taking care of treating everything that is coming from the habitat section uh, because for the rest, the water, the air, and most of the waste is treated at the pod level. And so this one is really more specifically uh, focusing on, on, on treating the the organic waste that is not eaten by human, um, and then all the all the waste that is produced by humans. So we can we can treat everything and put that back into the loop. Um, and then you have the habitation, the habitat unit. Uh, this is the section still um, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, we've been working on the on the on the on the other pods, uh, but for this one, we're looking forward to combine uh, inflatable technology because this is what we do for the other pods, but also with uh, uh, 3D printing um, uh, technology, um, and specifically for space because. What we believe is that there is a we want to have this you know inflatable system and then a, and then kind of a shell that will be on top of the on the of the inflatable system. Then you have the circulation unit, so you can use them. You can plug them, whatever uh, um, uh, whatever you want, and and how big you know you want to build the the, the module in the city. The idea for us was really with this flower. Then you can add another tunnel section, and then you can add another flower. So you can build this this you know organic shape growing cities. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the video there, but maybe it can be an occasion for next time. But but we work on a, on you know on a, on a parametric uh, a deployment of of those, of those flowers to build a city with the question where do you put the habitat, where do you put the greenhouse, um, so humans can feel good and we can have new shapes of city that are much more um, um, you know designed for happiness of human of planet. Um, and at the center, you have the mission control unit, and the mission control unit is where everything's plugged in, so you have inside the base of the mission of the mission control you need all the all the tunnels and all the pipes uh, that connect the different sections all together uh, and you can basically basically decide you know if you have only two pods just not to activate the other tunnels so so the air circulation the water circulation will only be uh, done between the, the several units that you have 
Uh, so, okay, that was the, that's, the plan is to build this module. So we want to build this module on the moon and on Mars. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of team, a lot of, a lot of work. Um, and so to go there, the, the strategy for, for the company is really to find a sustainable business model on Earth um, so we can be a sustainable company and, and you know, finance the R&D and hire the people and, and, uh, and you know, and, and looking forward to, put the, uh, to, to, to make life um, um, uh, multiplanetary. And so we focused first on, on developing the, the first pod, the biopod, which is a smaller version of the aeroponics and greenhouse pod that I presented before. And so this one is, is around the 40 square meter ground surface uh, so it's 10 meter long six meter wide four meter uh, four meter high um, and it's composed of uh, it's same exactly the same comp uh, um, uh, the same principle uh, so it's a closed environmental system that function function by itself uh, with its own air system water system um, uh, light system uh, and completely sealed with an airlock and the the way we design it so so again we, we took the 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 approach that we had to design a, a, a space station on, on the moon, and we took that back on Earth. And so, so it's, it's designed to be completely um, um, deployable. Um, so you have the composite base that's actually divided in four different pieces that you can fold and unfold. And on top of the of the composite base, you have an inflatable membrane. Uh, so as I said before, that is a, uh, that is a combination of several materials, ETFE, PTFE, and aerogel. And this one is designed for terrestrial applications. So it does not work on the moon at all. Uh, we will need a few iteration on the material design and combination so it can be solar radiation proof um, and so the entire structure is air supported um, so we have an airlock at the entrance and then we keep on blowing uh, blowing air uh, inside uh, maintaining a certain you know a, a slight over pressure uh, so so the system can stand um, and it's completely sealed and pressurized um, so the, the property of the material we we using um, uh, which is actually a patent pending uh, um, uh, combination of material uh, is allowing us to have very high insulation properties. Um, and so it means that uh, the system can work on any uh, extreme environment uh, uh, on Earth. Uh, but at the same time, it's letting light in. Um, and, so, and, and so it has a high uh, light transmittance property, which is allowing us to, less, to use much less LED than, than traditional you know, greenhouse or systems. Um, and and that's, that for us, it's very important in our design to, you know, to have this sustainable and durable approach. Um, and, and especially to look towards how we can, you know, use less energy and have more optimized system. Uh, and so inside the biopod, uh, you have a, a, this one is so dedicated to, to food production, to crop, crop cultivation, actually, because it, it's not only for food, it's also for flower, flowers or any plant. Um, and so inside the base, we put all the hardware, most of the hardware, there some hardware that is still on, on top of the raised floor. Uh, but so you'll find the, uh, the water treatment system. So you have a tank uh, that you fill up with water, and then the water is going into the aeroponic system. Uh, we catch back the water that is in the, um, that is in the the atmosphere inside the dome, um, and we treat it and we clean it directly at the pod level. So you have a UV disinfection system, you have ultra filtration membrane, um, and we combine that with an autonomous nutrient dosing that will deliver what the plants need based on the feedback we're getting from the sensor and from the cameras that we have inside the biopod. Um, integrated on the aeroponic system, um, so you have a, 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 we choose a, a LED lightning system that is actually a technology that is spin off from NASA. Um, and, um, and that is using much less energy compared to other LED system. Um, and, and, um, and that is very good because that's very uh, a large spectrum in terms of light. Uh, so it means we can cover the needs of a lot of like variety of plants. Um, and so, and we also have a, an advanced atmospheric system. So basically in the concept of operation, how is our air system working is that we are sucking air out of the exterior atmosphere, putting it inside the dome. So to maintain the overpressure, but also, um, traditionally, you know, greenhouses and, and um, you know, container farms, uh, they use they use CO two tank and O two tank to adjust uh, the level, the atmospheric level inside. In our case, we don't do that. We, we basically so we have CO two scrubber, we have O two generator that is just sucking from the outside environment and pushing it inside. So it's it's a it's a regenerative design approach uh, because because we don't want to. You know, we don't want to store and use tanks and then provide tanks of CO2, which is a, a complete nonsense for me because we're surrounded by CO2. Um, and so we integrated this technology that you don't find that they are really using, usually used for space. And, and, and we took that and we brought that back on Earth uh, so we can have a regenerative system here. 
Uh, inside, you have an advanced crop cultivation uh, um, uh, technology. So you can combine aeroponics with a substrate-based greenhouse. It's a modular system. So actually, you can have a full substrate-based greenhouse or only pure aeroponics. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's what it's called control environmental agriculture. So it means you, you really manage, uh, depending on the plant's ne plant needs and their stage of growth, uh, we are we are managing the you know uh, how much CO2 we are pushing, we are turning on, turning off the light, and doing all and doing all the delivery of the water and the nutrient dosing solution. Um, so the so so it's interesting to see on you know how you think about building a greenhouse in space and and um, and by thinking of how we want all the system to work inside and to be fully autonomous, we actually came up with a system system that is a, that is a you know, providing a lot of solution on earth and and and, uh, and a very competitive product compared to, you know, what other companies are building. Um, and so so the biopod saves water because we don't, we use aeroponics and we and we capture back the water that is in the atmospherics of the dome. Um, it's, it allows us to boost yield uh, because, because of the technology we're using, the aeroponics and substrate based, but also because we can control all the conditions inside. And it reduces the energy because of the combination of material that we're using. Um, and, uh, and especially aerogel that has been uh, very commonly used in space for its uh, uh, super light properties, but also very high insulation properties. Um, so the biopod is, is uh, fully autonomous. So we developed uh, several uh, uh, simulation uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, first one that we will launch uh, uh, actually next week, uh, we launched the beta next week, which is a, a crop selection uh, algorithm. So, so we've been working with, uh, uh, with ESA and NASA to understand what are the needs for astronauts and, and what is the typical diet and the typical nutritional requirements astronauts has, uh, have. Um, and so we designed this crop selection algorithm to, to tap into our database to select the crops and then to organize everything, all the planting process that we want to have inside the biopod and then organize all the schedule for long-term mission. And, and this algorithm is, is finding the best solution. So it's, it's trying to optimize the, the crop cultivation inside the biopod. So every day we can match the minimum nutritional requirements that we have for, the, for, for humans. Um, and then the biopod is fully automated. So, so, so we have an embedded system and control system that are inside the biopod and that are triggering all the hardware that we have to make sure the crop cultivation system can 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 work by itself. Uh, it's not robotized, um, so it means we don't do the uh, germination and and uh, and the harvesting through robots. It's still humans still will, will still need to go um, and to uh, and to harvest the plants. Um, but thanks to our uh, uh, simulation plus real time data, uh, we can tell to the farmers where when they can go inside and when they can harvest uh, the fruits and the vegetables. Um, that's here. It's a screenshot of um, of actually the crop selector uh, that we are um, uh, learning uh, next week um, and, and basically you'll be able to put you know the number of people you want to feed it will give you the number of biopod and it will do all the crop selection and tell you everything about the schedule the food stock uh, and you know what you get every day and basically what you can eat um, so application on earth uh, so this is a case study that we're doing with a uh, with a famous um, uh, cosmetic brand um, actually uh, because they have a lot of use use cases for using this technology here to grow plants in a sustainable and durable way um, this is how we envision you know the biopod on the moon uh, as i said the product is not space ready yet uh, we have a lot of iteration to do on the on the material system on the design of the hvac because the uh, hvac that is designed for earth is uh, you know it's it's blowing in space <laughs> so so you need a full redesign um but but we're getting there our plan is basically you know deliver the first biopod uh, the first uh, the first one will be built uh, it's currently under under you know manufacturing but uh, hopefully we'll get one i hope in the mojave desert in around september um, and then we, we're giving ourselves four years to make the iteration so it can be uh, uh, dedicated to the moon uh, and of course in the future um so it's not tomorrow but it's coming very soon uh, we want to put them on mars and um and same a lot of work needs to be done when it comes to you know protecting the system for solar radiation um, but this general idea of you know putting some showing that human can bring life to another planet i think can help and, uh, open consciousness here on earth and and make human more uh, conscious of you know the change that we have that having a, a world full of life and life thriving there and i believe our goal as humans is actually to protect life here but also to help bring it to um, uh, to um, other planets um so voila i hope it was not too long
uh, that's uh, that's us. Um, feel free to reach out. We are we are always uh, uh, recruiting, and uh, I need to lead the manufacturing. We're recruiting more architects, um, so uh, so so please uh, uh, please don't hesitate to contact uh, to contact us. Thank you, Barbara, so much. It was really amazing and incredible. Uh, I think the AI will be a core uh, technology for the future, uh, both on Earth and outside Earth. So you succeeded to demonstrate the importance of such a technology. Now we'll be moving on to our uh, other distinguished speaker, Malak. We are all waiting. Uh, I can't wait really to hear what you are preparing today. Malak had uh, promised us to deliver us today an incredible speech, as I always knew about her. So the floor is yours, but Elif will be just introducing to let the people know more about you. So yeah. please, Elif. Thank you. Yeah, our last presenter of today is Malak Trabasilab. Uh, she is CEO and founder of Vernoval Space and Tech Solution, CEO and founder of Trabasilab Legal uh, Consultancy, FZE. Uh, Mrs. Lieb holds a Bachelor of Law, Economics, LLM International Business Law, and M1 Public International Law and European Law. She is PhD candidate a, at KU Leuven, Belgium, Paris Sorbonne University in Abu Dhabi, and Paris Descartes Alumna. She is an in international business law jurist and international space law and policy senior legal advisor, strategist, and business consultant. Her practice focuses on complex international business transactions, due diligence international contracts, foreign investment, legal risk, commercial legal matters, alternative dispute resolution, corporate governance, company law, space insurance, new space legal challenge, and space policies. She is a multidisciplinary professional with renowned entrepreneurship and, and international business experience. Thanks a lot, and the field is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here today, and, and uh, thank you for the presentation um, and, uh, and, and for the invitation. And actually, uh, once would say, what she's doing here, she's practicing law and what she's doing in, in uh, space architecture and, and among these amazing uh, architects and, and, um, and uh, uh, brains behind uh, amazing projects. Actually, uh, yeah, my presentation is, is, is about uh, like the way I was presented. It's about what I do, but so much else is not, is not included because uh, um, it all range around one purpose is uh, sustainability and the elevation and the evolution of our species. Um, in addition to law practice and my studies in law and economics, and uh, as I'm, I'm practicing law, I'm economist also, and I am interested in, 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 in the economy of space. Uh, my PhD is around, um, it, it, it was initially around space sustainability, but I took it into uh, a next stage uh, to, to get uh, into the space uh, investment. I actually, I, I, and, and the, the, the correlation be, between investment protection and state's role um, to ensure uh, the balance of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, interest between um, the different competing interests based on the space sustainability uh, doctrinal analysis that uh, I, I had to address space. Um, and, um, and actually, uh, when we talk about sustainability, the sustainability is, is not only about um, environmental protection. Even though I'm inter an environmentalist here on Earth, uh, uh, the way how I see the, 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 uh, how it is going in the space arena and, and what I'm, I'm, I'm practicing also in terms of, uh, of um, bringing, uh, anchoring, let's say, sustainability into um, um, any business practice which is um, uh, revolving around this idea of sustainability and how taking sustainability from Earth into space, or let's say uh, some colleagues uh, it, earlier, they spoke about SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and we have 17, and, and, and uh, uh, I'm not the only one. A lot of uh, scholars, they spoke about how about uh, um, uh, like um, incorporating new sustainable development goal 18 into this scope in order to widen it and like that our our um, um, 
uh, evolution and our interference into this new domain, which was called before the new frontier. Uh, it goes up to um, to include space because actually this is the way how we are moving forward. Today we have limitation in our biological uh, uh, structure and and we have issues with our biology that we cannot inhabit an, uh, in, in another planet or we cannot stay for long term into a space structure outside of our or beyond our uh, um, our uh, Earth boundary. But but uh, today we cannot do it but we are doing it through our technology. Today, we are on Mars through our rovers and probes. And this is what, what I advocate for, it's a space sustainability to be anchored in the existing way. And, and here I would say the sustainable development concept and perspective, it's in light of the current international space law framework and, and economic framework also. So we are going through a, a new phase in our space um, economy today, and uh, and and uh, I will I will talk about the new space economy and share a, a, a graph, um, a, a chart which I worked on based on a lot of studies and and uh, and the practice and the way how the space uh, industry is going forward. Uh, but but uh, first, I would say, what is space law? A lot of people they ask, what is space law? Uh, so space law consists of the body of law governing uh, governing space related activities. So the space-related activities in law and in the practice, we need to check what falls under this scope, under the national laws and international laws. And this is a practice that we see so much, and we have sometimes uh, different conflicts of laws that we need to check which treaty is applicable and which law is applicable to that uh, um, particular uh, activity. And if it falls under that, that uh, for example, national law, we need to check which other national law that it will have long arm jurisdiction in order to make the mitigation of the risk that it could happen, which is uh, um, legal risk, but also we have economic risk and we have other risks that we need to uh, uh, check and, and, uh, and, and see how it goes. So space law, much like general uh, uh, um, uh, law, comprises of variety of international agreements, treaties, conventions, United Nations, uh, general assemblies, resolutions, as well as rules and regulations of international organizations. And why I'm talking about space law here and, and national laws and international laws, actually because, uh, uh, like I said, uh, space, our activities into uh, space is international by nature. Uh, nations are active right now. We see the, the issues about, um, let's say, regula regulatory competitiveness that is going on right now. Each country is trying to bring or attract uh, each country who is, of, of course, uh, like a, a spacefaring country or a country that is aiming to be spacefaring, trying to attract to each ecosystem, national ecosystem, uh, um, uh, investors and also um, um, entrepreneurs in order to enter to their uh, economy and of course uh, impact their their uh, GDPs and impact their national economies and and of course also impact their uh, development um, in 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 terms of um, social uh, development. So um, when we go to the the space sustainability concept. It is, it is simple. It's coming from the long-term sustainability, uh, um, which was defined in the United Nations guideline for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities adopted by um, the, 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 the Committee on Purpose, uh, for, uh, for Peaceful Use of Outer Space, COCUS, on 21st uh, of June, 2019. And it stated, it is the ability to maintain the conduct of space activities and definitely in, uh, into the future in a manner that realizes the objective of equitable access to benefits um, um, for the benefit of the exploration and use of outer space for peaceful purposes in order to meet the needs of the present generations while preserving the outer space environment for future generation. And this is, is like a whole, you know, a PhD thesis. So many 
competing interests that, like uh, right there. And the thing is like how to the, it, it answer the, the a question is how to ensure the continuity of peaceful per, uh, space activities for peaceful purposes because space needs to remain for peaceful purposes while ensuring the socio-economic development. It's very important. It's the social in development on Earth and the economic de development on Earth, of course, but also how it can be, uh, uh, how to ensure the economic development in outer space, because the future, we need to have a sustainable economy in outer space. So to me, why we need this is to, to, to meet the needs of the present generation without jeopardizing the outer space environment for future generations to the space exploration. Actually, when I talk like this, and I am with entrepreneur, uh, the like-minded, they like it so much and they agree about it and, and they, 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 they try to know more. And it's like, how can we be in this, um, you know, uh, how can we, how, what can we bring to this philosophy? But others, they don't like it because actually I'm the bad guy. I'm environment, uh, an environmentalist uh, person. You know, it, it reminds us of, of uh, previous time and the hippies and everything and people, they are walking around, around and trying to preserve the environment. But guess what? Today, we are doing everything in order to mitigate the, the, the risks that is happening with the climate change, but the risks are uh, that, that it was, the risks that were highlighted and addressed before, they are happening today. And I have uh, uh, some some articles um, which are uh, describing the, the the way how satellite technologies are um, um, uh, monitoring climate change and and monitoring the risks and mitigating helping to monitor the risks and mitigate uh, uh, the issues that's happening. But we are there today. Well, uh, when I speak about this, also I, I I will I will highlight something happening today, and actually it it got me very it got me very very um, let's say uh, um, eager about about uh, how people can understand that it's very 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 um, important and essential and critical for our future or for today uh, um, expo space exploration and uh, intervention into this uh, risky environment. Well, today I, uh, there, is, there is an article um, just released like um, maybe five hours ago or so. It's about the, the, the problem that, that SpaceX, um, human, uh, uh, well, uh, crew um, team, they had to uh, make a maneuver because they, they, they had a risk of, of, uh, of an, an unidentified object. And here I say, are we waiting till, till, um, till, till something catastrophic event happen and we lose life in order and, and, and even worse? Because before we were saying, we need to mitigate the issues of space debris because, because of, of financial and economic loss and, and of course, environmental issues. But today we are sending astronauts and, and future tourists into outer space. How are, we going to, how are we going to make it if we don't move and we don't make, uh, um, we, don't, we don't address this issue and not just uh, uh, enacting soft laws and making uh, um, uh, committees and, and talking about it and, and, and trying to uh, highlight the risk. But the problem is like, we need to take action. So space sustainability is crit critical because actually it's not about environmental protection only. It's about the, the balancing the competing interests and the competing interests are as you as, as i mentioned within the, the the question it is the environmental uh, protection it is the economic development it is it is the social uh, the development and the other sphere is is also uh, the institutional uh, um, um, sphere which is how to make this uh, um, uh, balance of interest and, and why I'm talking about this to, to entrepreneur and to uh, uh, space architecture uh, 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 fellows, because it is important in, in, the, in, the, in the situation that is happening here, we have a legal voice. We have an issue with international uh, uh, laws uh, that we have void. We have issues of uh, competing nations that they don't want to sit on the table like in the 70s and, and, and try to find 
uh, a way how to agree uh, about um, ways and norms of behavior into outer space. Uh, and, and also because uh, states, or when I say states, it means countries, uh, they are not, um, uh, let's say, they are responsible legally, internationally, responsible and liable for the private actors uh, um, act activities in outer space. So, so it's very, very important in the, in the, um, in, in, in my opinion that in, in the, um, there's, there's a legal void and there's issue and, and you are active and you are making, um, uh, uh, projects. And there's one thing. Your 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 role is critical because uh, it, it, when there is a, a, let's say a lockdown a issue in in, in international uh, law and uh, um, and issues to fill these gaps uh, because it's moving very slowly and uh, um, the role of private actor is critical because they can fill the gap uh, to make uh, certain uh, norms of behavior become customary, becomes a norm in order to uh, move forward. So it's very important. So the, the space exploration uh, economic benefits, of course, because like I said, there are uh, different interests that they are, they are competing. So when we speak about uh, the, the economic benefits, and I see a lot of people, they are very upset about the constellations that is going on right now and, and deployment of uh, hundreds of satellites, and we have other nations other than the Americans. They are also um, uh, willing to deploy um, a constellation. The issue is 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 how to make the balance. We need satellite technology. This constellation will make um, an amazing um, addition to social development in areas and places and countries that they don't even have network, they don't even have internet. And it will reduce also the, 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 the um, like the, the internet fees economically, it would be uh, beneficial for, for people around the world because it will give them, uh, give them um, like a, a service with lesser um, to pay. So it's, it's very important to see how to do that. In 2000, uh, 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 18, the Space uh, Foundation uh, claimed that, uh, or, or um, announced that, uh, based on their research, that the space uh, economy is about 414.8 billion. And of course, I wrote also about the issue about the, the, the data of the space economy based in, on, on comparison and comparative analysis uh, between the different data that is given by different uh, uh, reports. And they are not aligned because there is an issue with uh, double counting, an issue also with the difference in the way how uh, countries they are uh, making their data and and based on their determinants that they are chose uh, they chose to um, uh, to count when it comes to the space economy. And of course, there are some uh, um, data it couldn't be um, uh, added because of the impact of space technology on other sectors that it is difficult or space uh, exploration that it's difficult to be quantified. So um, I will not go through so much into the benefits of the space uh, uh, economy um, because actually it's obvious and I will be happy to do it another time. Uh, but um, the space sustainability concept that, that I, I proposed is, is um, one of its kind concept because it's construed and orchestrated, uh, orchestrated based on sustainable development principles with the legal principles of governing um, the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space. So uh, the concept was um, uh, put into the stream of international law in 1987 in the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, or the, what we call it the Brentland Commission. So under this report, the, the um, Brentlet Commission stated that it's the development that meets the needs of the present uh, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It also added that it's a process of change in which the exploitation of resources, and this is very, very important because actually to make structures and to have sustainable economy in outer space, 
we need to have uh, we need to have um, um, we need to address very well the process of cha of change in 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 which the exploitation of resources is happening. So uh, it also uh, added uh, also the d direction of investment, which is very very impo important because actually you want to make spacecraft uh, structures and and bring our our um, species into outer space. The issue is like uh, who's going to invest. How is going to happen? Uh, well, what is the economic, uh, um, uh, the best economy that it needs to be implemented? The investors today, they have issues to invest because of the long-term return and also because of the risky uh, environment. Uh, well, even though we have amazing um, like um, injection of investments that it wasn't happening before private investor, we still depend on state uh, or governmental uh, funding and this one is going back to the the, the tax money and can you imagine if a, a big tragedy happens and uh, w within those you know uh, issues that 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 related to uh, space debris right now do you think that 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 NASA for example will continue funding um, um, uh, private public partnership contracts? Um, and input funds and other type of funding um, that or schemes of funding that the 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 the, the government is uh, is putting into space activity, it will be a havoc. It will be chaos. So uh, the other the other um, point is also that the sustainable development um, the report our common future added is also in, in, in addition to the process and the direction of an investment, it's the orientation of technological development and institutional change are all in, they needed to be all in harmony and enhance both current and future potential to meet the human needs and aspirations. And this is very, very important. So um, also the sustainable development is the process that is based on the interconnection between the economic, social, environmental dimension aiming to improve men's living standards without jeopardizing the mother earth ecosystem and harming the environment. And I added to it also the, 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 the other planets and, and the earth orbits and, and so on. So actually we're talking about uh, what I call it's a sustainable uh, cosmic, idea, philosophy. Uh, so the, the philosophy of the sustainable development phenomenon is rooted in the interrelation between the three dimensions, as uh, I, I mentioned. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I think I have, um, I don't know how I have uh, how much time left, but if we go to the principles of the uh, Outer Space Treaty, which is the, 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 the Magna Carta of space uh, law, uh, uh, the first space treaty that it was, um, it, uh, everyone knows the OSC or the Outer Space Treaty, the main principles are freedom of exploration and scientific investigation, non-appropriation principle, and it, uh, and, and it has consequences of space ventures. And this issue uh, uh, created some, some, uh, some problems because actually the non-appropriation appropriation um, it was directed to um, uh, to states or, or state parties and also to private actors but after uh, United States um, uh, they they enacted their first um, uh, um, uh, like they were the first to enact that uh, it is um, to give to confer this uh, uh, property the the, the right of uh, uh, exploitation and uh, and uh, uh, appropriation to their um, private actors, but not to uh, to states, and it created some some and keep on created some issues. But after that, now uh, uh, academia agreed that it's fine because they found they found uh, uh, like I said uh, uh, because of the void they found a loophole uh, in in this and they they agreed upon. But when and and the other one. The, the other principle in the Outer Space Treaty is the state's duties in outer space governance under the Outer Space Treaty. And the state has a duty to uh, regulate, has duty and right to regulate um, and, and uh, to, to enact laws in order to govern its uh, uh, private actors' activities in outer space. Because like I said before, uh, member states um, or, or, or uh, contracting parties to the Outer uh, Space Treaty uh, they are liable internationally and responsible internationally 
on uh, uh, like uh, for the any uh, private actors is falling under the scope of their um, jurisdiction. And here, it's it's um, it, if I speak about uh, the international law and and uh, the different uh, things like uh, related to, it will take long time. Uh, but but what I wanted to end with uh, to this as as um, an application to this sustainable space for humanity, I made this. Um, I'm 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 uh, pushing forward or advocating for on orbit servicing. And actually, uh, a colleague earlier spoke about uh, robotics in space, and it's uh, it's it, it's one of the important um, activity space activity that could make a critical um, uh, addition to the sustainable space for humanity um, philosophy uh, in order to boost the economy and uh, mitigate the, the, the risks and also mitigate the issue of space debris. And of course, when we have a, um, a sustainable space economy, we would have sustainable uh, um, um, economy, global economy on earth. And there's an issue also I highlight is, is the issue of equity when there are some uh, uh, states are getting uh, or, or private actors are getting super rich from um, exploitation of, uh, of uh, mineral, for example, in the future or whatever, how that will be um, uh, like the, the impact for um, equity on earth and inequity on earth because actually the, the 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 issue we will have super 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 rich people and we will have we still have uh very uh poor people so how is going to be happening with um this uh um equality and equity issue and and uh, and here i don't know how long i still have to uh, share just few charts to show on orbit servicing um um, impact for a sustainable space economy and at the same time uh, for the uh, mitigating the risk of the environmental risk, which is um, an application of the sustainable space for humanity um, uh, um, advocacy. Dr. Summer, do I still have like <laughs> five minutes? Or, uh, the time is out, but if you have uh, to wrap things up in just a couple of minutes, uh, you, you are welcome to do so. If you'd like to show uh, the, our audience something. Yes, actually, I, I, I would like to share. Uh, am, I, am, I, am I sharing? Uh, a yes, yes, yes. Okay, fine. Uh, so, um, yeah, here uh, I have a very important quote for uh, Konstantin Tsiolovsky, the father of the, the, the uh, uh, rocket science and uh, actually um, uh, it comes from the cosmic, uh, cosmism uh, philosophy which is uh, about how it's an imperative it's it's uh, it's a spiritual and it's uh, a moral imperative for humans to um, to to, uh, to to go into outer space and uh, to get uh, away from an issue of existential existential risk so uh, here I will I will go uh, directly to the to the space economy. Here for today we have uh, uh, the main parameters here of space economy, and we still we still not thriving in outer space. And in order to thrive in outer space, we need to um, to, to 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 pass beyond and and go beyond what is um let's say the the parameters that exist in today in order to uh to have uh, habitats in order to have uh let's say um a sustainable economy a six lunar economy uh lunar economy and so on and martian economy but but in order to do so it's very important to reason based on balancing the interest and and going sustainably and, and this chart I made uh, based on, on a lot of readings from uh, a perspective of new space economy and what we have today. So today the space economy is going to the third phase or, or, or its third stage. The first stage was, um, um, let's say in, in a way that is uh, um, uh, maintained uh, in the hand of uh, uh, the government of um, institutions and depend of the institutional funding. 
And here we have, this one is non-exhaustive also, um, uh, chart that it shows how, uh, what are the main trends. So we have new trends going on today. We have uh, innovative public funding, which we still um, rely upon. And we have classic financial schemes, which is um, uh, the one that uh, they help how the satellite uh, market or the satellite industry get into uh, um, maturity today. And we have new investment schemes. And this is the very important one and important for you also as an uh, um, uh, entrepreneur who wants to have um, a, a future uh, settlements and future projects in outer space. So we have billionaire owned money, we have venture capital, seed and prize money, we have acquisition, we have a, a SPAC special purpose uh, acquisition. Uh, companies and we have that debt financing and we have new business models and uh, the business models is commercial value over uh, at the forefront. We have alignment to new market opportunities because today we have IoT and we have other opportunities that it's needed. We have scalable business models and this one is very important because actually the scalable business model, it can start on earth and it can go up uh, into uh, outer space and that's what are the newcomers are doing right now. And we have the emphasis on vertical integration also. Um, we have the market trends, we have new emerging markets, we have new products and services demand, we have additional capacity needed, new value chain, new market opportunities, and we have the technological symbiosis that without it, we will not move forward at all. So we have the, uh, what are uh, the main trends in this um, a sphere, we have rapid prototyping instead of theoretical studies because we were doing theoretical so much, but today we are going into prototyping and, uh, and, and deployment and, uh, and other, um, other uh, uh, um, like trends. And we have miniaturization and we have a small little satellite that is very, very important. Uh, for satellite technology, but also big risk. And we have automation, we have off-the-shelf technologies, functional specifications, software platform, spin in from other sectors and process spinning and so on. And we have new threats. And I spoke about the new threats other than the issues that is going today, uh, which is very, very important uh, to, to address. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, concerning, which is the spy, uh, uh, cyber threat. So I, I will go to... Uh, one of the last charts here to show how robotics are very, very important, which is the on-orbit orbit servicing that they, they, if they are deployed, because today they're not that much used, they're still in the hands of few uh, parties and uh, mainly uh, um, of uh, governmental entities and some other big giants, they are working on it and, and, and doing it. So we, it, 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 it creates a sustainable economy within this uh, low orbit uh, and, and so forth. And it can, it can help in, in, in uh, uh, scaling up, like I said. So it makes the debris removal, transportation, uh, refueling of uh, satellites, assembly of uh, space structures, uh, human exploitation assistance and um, and recycling. So it's very, very important. And this, the, the type of on-orbit service and maturity curve today, it, it's not that much, uh, uh, let's say, brilliant. It's going and it's moving slowly, but also it's the risk in space. So we have uh, here how it goes from R&D to demo to market uh, and production and growth to maturity. And we're not at maturity uh, yet. And um, it helps in the insurance inspection because actually we have uh, almost like like uh, um, around 10% of in orbit uh, um, 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 satellites that they are insured, which is a problem because actually we need more. And it makes refuel, repair, upgrade, and modular SD. And we have the, the, the lunar getaway also in order to have future artists architectures and main, main mission, we need to have uh, a more mature on-orbit servicing. And uh, here we have um, NASA is working on it and uh, is having it uh, right now. And we have Skylab, uh, Hubble servicing and, and so forth. I think I, um, it, it makes, it has environmental protection, uh, an impact. It, it, um, it has economic impact, social impact, and impact on the future expansion. 
And here I have a structure that I found it uh, on Pixabay, which is very, very nice. And I hope someone make it. It's, it's very, very important. And how on service servicing can help through uh, 3D um, uh, printing um, make in outer space structures and, uh, and assemble them. And uh, thank you very much. Um, so chart in the course of sustainable multiplanetary culture. That's who I am and that's what I do. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Malik, so much for your this extensive presentation. We do appreciate the energy and the enthusiasm in you and all our guest speakers. So uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions from uh, in, in a manner of panel discussion. We can all share our uh, vision in answering the questions. So I think we have a question that is posted a little bit earlier. Let me just read the question. Here we go. So hello, thanks for presenting. I enjoyed bionic shapes and land. I enjoyed bionic shapes and landscapes a lot. But wondering how feasible it is for space environments. Not everything is is possible to be printed. Are there any studies estimating costs for different construction methods on Mars and Moon? So, who would like to start the discussion? Uh, I started answering, this is Phnom, I started answering the questions uh, in yeah, writing, uh, multiple options. Uh, obviously, 3D printing is, is big right now because it allows us to perhaps use materials that are on site and not having to send them from Earth, which costs quite a lot. Uh, prefabricated parts. So, you know, there's always, you know, aluminum and all the metals that you can, you can build with, but also certain types of plastics, uh, which can be useful, especially for interiors, because 3D printing regolith is not going to be great to breathe in, in indoor environments. Uh, for insulation, you can use the different types of foams that expand on the surface. Uh, I'm talking to someone right now who is uh, growing mycelium in a way that uh, can be controlled. You can control the structure and that, that, that can be very, very useful uh, for, for structures as well. Um, cables can be used as well. Uh, I'm talking to another person who's doing uh, hemp-based nanotubes. Uh, which happen to be much stronger and much cheaper than the typical nanotubes, uh, carbon nanotubes you have access to today. And then, of course, inflatables and expandable structures, you know, uh, um, ha have, been, have been explored. Um, these are quite interesting, especially when you have limited space in a payload shroud and want to um, expand these structures into something much more, uh, much larger for, for, for human consumption. So and thank you, Fnam. Uh, Vitor, please, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I can, I can build on top of that. It's, this, is, this is like literally my PhD uh, topic, like uh, construction with SRU um, for Moon and Mars. And also yesterday we had uh, um, a seminar that I organized together with the East about um, additive manufacturing construction uh, on Moon and Mars, in which we included a ton of like companies and uh, scientists from ESA and uh, there were some that were like veterans like Enrico Dini for the shape that is probably the guy that it's in, the, invented the concept of like building uh, uh, on a celestial, celestial body uh, with the uh, uh, regulate but um, and also like I worked last year for uh, with Icon 3D uh, and search exactly on the, this first project from NASA about the first 3D printed lunar base. Um, so there are many, of course, like take over many um, problems still to overcome about this technology, especially one of the most problematic, it's probably the printing time because it's still a pretty slow uh, technique compared to something like deployables. And of course there are problem uh, um, that are caused by the environment, that it's not ideal, uh, like, for example, uh, extreme uh, mm, thermal excursion, uh, uh, radiations, and other things like that that can jeopardize the, uh, the, the printing process, uh, mm, leaving a lot of residual stresses in the structure and stuff like that. But... Um, on the long term, this is the, definitely the only way in which we will do something 
uh, on Earth. I'm not talking about 3D printing. I'm talking just like building with ICU. 3D printing is, of course, it's a it's a good way to uh, to reduce the tools. So, like when we build, and also right now on Earth on a construction site, there are we use an enormous pan of tools uh, for construction, like cranes and. Uh, um, excavators and um, uh, mixers and there is a, a lot of like machinery and people involved in the construction process and uh, kind of like the idea behind the 3D printing process is that um, is that you can reduce the number of tools that you use possibly to just like one giant tool uh, that can do everything and this is a very important thing when because we have always to address the fact that uh, the construction, uh, like the lunar Martian construction will be done autonomously and uh, before humans come uh, on site. Um, so we have to account for the fact that all these processes need to be done uh, in, completely, uh, uh, in a completely autonomous way. And this is, the actually the biggest gap in the technology uh, more than the printing technology itself that anyway it will complete it will completely change between mars and moon because uh, probably moon on the moon will be uh, for example um, uh, for sintering while uh, it will be um, geopolymer uh, deposition on mars for example but that's not the Big problem. The big problem will also be uh, the um, uh, the the robotic part. We still don't have enough like uh, um, confidence in the uh, autonomous capability uh, of uh, robotic asset to give them all this work to do. Especially consider stuff like on the moon, it's kind of like easier because there. But on Mars, there is a huge delay, so we can't rely on operations and we will have to rely completely on, on autonomous operation and we are kind of pretty still pretty far from that so, uh, let's say on earth it's another story um, on earth 3d printing already demonstrated um, enormous capabilities at any scale of construction um, currently happy score uh, use like a 3d printer that is like the biggest 3d printer in the world that we can print like a three-story building, uh, basically without moving. Uh, recently, uh, Wasp 3D uh, did the uh, finalized the, the first real uh, ICU experiment of 3D printing uh, on Earth. So they basically built uh, an entire house uh, with the, the hurt and the soil that was taken like uh, literally uh, two meters from the construction site. Um, so there are a lot of experiments ongoing and uh, also the geopolymer uh, studies they hello has uh, there are companies like the Renka that they built their big core business on engineering materials so we can uh, uh, literally create like uh, um, construction material that uh, it's answered directly to the needs that we that we will have um, in terms of the mechanical properties uh, and the uh, physical properties of the material. So I think that just to conclude, it just I wanted to just to, to say how many like possibilities, many roads, uh, many different paths we have uh, had um, in the development of this technology. But I think it will be really impactant, like it will have a, a real impact on Earth in the next 10, 15 years, not before. Um, for example, the Emirates, they declared, they declared that, that until the, the 2030, they want to have at least like the 25% of the world new building constructed, um, build the, um, um, built with the additive manufacturing processes. That's Thank it. you, Vittorio. <clears throat> Uh, just uh, to wrap things, also I have, uh, I would like to share a core concept of the sustainable architecture. Flower, I just would like to say uh, thank you so much. I have to leave. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Thank uh, you, Michal. If there are any questions, please contact me through social media, LinkedIn, Instagram. And thank you again. Thank you, Michal, for your presence today. We hope to see you again in the future.
So <clears throat> just uh, I would like to share a core concept of sustainable architecture. It indicates that if you'd like to really to build sustainability, use the available materials, use what is beneath your uh, legs. So if you would like to go <clears throat> to the North Pole, you will just start constructing the, the igloo. <clears throat> Sahara deserts in Middle East are all uh, built in, the, in dirt and uh, sand. Wherever you go on, on Earth, you are using the available materials. The ISRU, the in situ resource utilization concept, it is the same method. It is just we are thinking with the same uh, mindset. Uh, the beginnings are always the same. When we started our civilization on Earth, maybe uh, millions of years ago, we used caves <clears throat> and then we start. Um, started uh, searching for oasis or water sources and start using the available materials, which were which are pretty much thing that what we are doing today. We are searching for lunar caves and then we are using also the available materials for the for the high cost. The the category of civilization or maybe the settlements would be the much more appropriate word is uh, going through four phases. For first phase of colonization is just to put your flag on a new territory and bounce back to your homeland. The second category is a small missions, maybe for six months in less than one year, to start exploring and start understanding the new land, but you are connected to the motherland. The third phase of colonization is the little bit independent where people can go to these colonies and start dealing with them uh, as it is home. The fourth category, and this is the most critical, is people uh, declaring independence from the motherland, and this is also associated with uh, conflicts and so. Uh, for my work, what I presented today, I think I'll be working on the third or the fourth uh, colonization phases. So that means we have there, there is no option to be connected to, to the motherland, to the earth, but the, the one thing that we connected or transferred from the other uh, motherland is, will be the technology, the AI and the technology, and maybe some samples of the green life. And turning to the green life, we have one more last question. I know you are all exhausted, guys. This is the last question uh, that we have. It uh, says, all plants will be grown in a closed area like greenhouses. What do you think about how the food that will be grown in greenhouses will be affecting the human health and its impact, and also as well as the eating habits? So... I can start uh, answering that yeah, question and, and people can add on to it. So the type of food that we can grow in uh, uh, using hydroponics or aeroponics or, or like closed environment is fairly limited at this point. You know, there, there's only certain, certain types of food like lettuce, uh, capsicum, tomatoes, things like that. And you can't, really build in it. Yeah. You, you can't really build an entire diet off of this. Uh, right now on the ISS, they send a lot of freeze dried food. Uh, that they have to replenish all the time. Same thing for water. Uh, so, so at this point in time, we actually don't have a solution that allows us to go to Mars and come back uh, in, in three years time without sending all of the food that we need. And even freeze-dried food has a, has a shelf life, right? Um, yeah. so, so having the option to grow food is, is great, but it ha also has to have nutritional value. Uh, there are other options that uh, people are looking into, like mycelium-based food, 3D-printed foods, algae-based uh, uh, nutrition, uh, which is a great environment and all that. And also, we have to think about adding supplements of many kinds to help with uh, slowing down uh, the, uh, the, the, the longevity problem in space. So in space, you, you microgravity, radiation, all of these extreme environments um, conditions are actually aging your, your body much faster. For example, your arteries um, like harden over time as you, as you age and um, they, they, they harden much, much faster when you're up on the ISS, for example. It's going to be probably worse when you go to Mars. So everything that we do in terms of food has to satisfy uh, nutrition, um, uh, has to, to, to cover you know, a slowing down of, uh, of, of the aging process. It, we have to integrate uh, variety and pleasure, right? Because you can't really force people to go out there and eat stuff they don't like. Uh, also, there's a huge problem with astronauts going to the ISS. They tend to lose weight. I think to date, there's only one astronaut that gained weight uh, after going to the ISS. Everybody else lost some. Uh, that's, that's a mix of losing weight from lack of... Um, uh, 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 lack of... Um, um, 
you know, they, they're not interested in eating the food. It's just not important to them, but also bone and uh, muscle mass is, is happening a lot in microgravity. So I'm going to stop here and uh, somebody else. Yeah, can thank you. For now. Well, uh, dealing with the space technology and space architecture, we, we, uh, people must realize that we do not have all of the answers right now. Uh, it reminds me of the first uh, competition that I wanted to share in 2009. The brief was prepared by Mark Cohen, one of the chief NASA architects. It was very interesting to indicate that this project will be start in the construction process in 2067. That was the two, 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 two in the year 2009. It, so it was a very time span. What I want to say, uh, I would like to remind our audience with the same uh, introductory statement that I started our talk today. We, we might not have uh, all the technology right now, but it will be available in the near future. We are developing technologies for the space exploration and the space missions. So uh, even if we do not have all of the answers right now, it will be available in the near future. Thank you, Fnam. Thank you, uh, guys. We have uh, one more question, and it will be the last one, I promise. So I think that one will be dealing with the socio-economic Circle, it say, uh, the ask says, uh, to achieve a social, economic, circular economy approach, uh, Star Trek economics, with the help of unexpected advances in quantum technology, what would you want those advances to be? I think Malak would be the most appropriate uh, guest to, to elaborate on this uh, point. Yes. Um, yeah, I said I will uh, give the floor to my colleague, because I took so much time in my... Uh, on my presentation, but um, yes, um, and it's coming from Dave um, De Silva. Actually, he is, uh, I know him, he is working on quantum computing and um, dark star technology. Uh, it's uh, actually, um, uh, in terms of economic circular, uh, like a circular economy based on um, Star Trek economics, I haven't worked on it. Um, maybe he's the, uh, the one who is uh, fit um, best fit to uh, to answer that, uh, but for, of course, um, yeah. W one of the things that I, I I follow also is the new breakthrough technologies, and that's why I'm I'm interested in quantum technology and learning that. So and and uh, learn quantum computing. Uh, the thing is, like quantum computer and quantum based technologies, they will be uh, take us in total different uh, um, uh, worlds. And this is what I say to everyone when they are making their long-term uh, plans in, in business and related to space structures and things like that, is like, please look at the way how quantum technologies will uh, move forward. Quantum uh, uh, communications, quantum computing, exactly, even though a lot they say that it's not going to be uh, deployed until uh, commercially until until uh, like uh, some time from now I keep on saying well you never know never say never and and technology is moving and scaling up very very quickly so um, I, I cannot talk about uh, about the Star Trek economics because I haven't worked on it it's okay so thank you all uh, for gathering this today let me just uh, take a moment to thank the Digital Futures and the Hidden Knights Bear team that uh, organized everything in a professional way, and they are the main reasons of this successful gathering today. Uh, you guys has proven that uh, different people from different nations, different cultures and languages can be gathered today, sharing their experiences and visions. Some of the brightest minds today, I was honored really to be among you. We're gathered to share your contributions for the mankind prosperity, both outside and on, and on Earth. So our diversity has proven is, is to be is our real wealth when we share the same purpose. Our gathering today was this proof that we can connect and cooperate under one umbrella, which is the future of humanity. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Digital Futures. Looking forward to meet you, and I am sure that I will be seeing you all together again in a, a nice gathering as this one. So thank you. Thank you, Digital Future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. So, so I think uh, we will be leaving uh, the gathering now.